Hi, I'm, I'm Simon, and I'm just going to speak for a few minutes about what we might do in a different way, come up with a better scheme. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so, key thing really that determines the whole scheme is think of the standard of protection. So, what level of flood are we protecting the town from? And at the moment, it's a one in 200 year return period, which is a 0.5% probability that it could happen in any year. So, that's the plus, then we add climate change, which is different for the river and the coast. But that's the kind of standard protection, and that's not set out in the law in the act of 2009 which is the underpinning act of parliament so nowhere does it say you have to have that standard protection in other places like hoik it's actually one in 75 year return period so it's a lower level of protection U uk generally used to use one in 50 year protection in the past and when it went up to one in 100 year return period so these things are are things that the town could make its own decision about having a different standard of protection, understanding of the risks involved in doing that. Uh, but as been pointed out, we haven't had a major flood in Musselburgh well since 1948, so we're completely different from Dumfries, uh, for example, or, or some of the other towns that Roger mentioned as well, where they do have continual flooding on a yearly basis every couple of years. Obviously, we would all feel differently about flood risk if we genuinely were being flooded every few years. In fact, we're not, must mean something important. Um, so if I, I'll just go perhaps just to the, 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 the diagram, it'll be easier to explain it. Yeah, so what, what I propose then is, so we, we need to decide the standard protection. Who should decide that then? So that's actually not a scientific judgment, really. It's got science involved, but in the end, it's a policy decision. So, and that's to do with our perception of risk. And we've all got, risk is a bit like a, a thermometer. We've all got a different levels of uh, where we sit on the risk thermometer. So some people are risk takers. We've all met people, risk takers. Some of us might be risk takers. Other people, are they risk averse? Are they careful? Are they get they nervous about any risk? And we all sit somewhere on, the spe on that spectrum of risk. So that, in the, in the end, it's like we have to come to some sort of consensus on what, as a community, as a town, what level of risk we want to live with. And we have to be prepared to then live through the consequences of that decision. So what I'm suggesting is that that isn't something I want councillors to decide because they've got no insight that we don't have. It's not something I want scientists to decide or officials. They've got no more right to decide than I do. Um, and actually, because we all live here, we should decide. So what I'm suggesting, we set up some citizen panels. So you might have one in for the North Esk River, for the South Esk, and then on the coastal zone, those panels would then would have to like decide who's going to represent the community, maybe 15 people. You'd have a secretariat to help those panels. You'd have facilitators running the meetings. And then they would come up with recommendations on what they think the standard of protection should be. They would be able to call upon experts to get expert advice from different universities, from research institutes. But it would be driven by, in the end, those panels would then drive it. And then the councillors would come in. You'd have a joint panel with the councillors and then they would then come up with a recommendation that is put to a vote in the town. So we actually have a public vote of anyone 16 or over who lives in EH21. They, they decide. Um, now, that might sound like, you know, we, we don't do things like that here. Well, you know, if you go to Switzerland, that is the normal way. They use referenda all the time to make local decisions that have big consequences. So it's very normal in some places. And, you know, I think we, what we're facing is a failure of politicians, a failure of the council. And that's why I'm suggesting this, because I don't think their current decision-making process works. So we need to come up with an alternative. Um, so, so once that, if, if the public, if, so if the recommendation from the panel, if that was not accepted, then we'd have to like think about, okay, how is it modified to make it closer to what the public have said. Um, so go, go, go to the next slide. Um, so once you've worked out what is the level of protection we're looking here, so how much, so if you have a really high rainfall event like they had in Brecon with Storm Babbitt a couple of months or so ago, so imagine a huge amount of water falling, that's going to obviously impose, a, you know, increase the flood risk 
So how much of that, and then, then you've got your standard protection you're trying to protect against. So let's say it's an event like Storm Babbitt that you're trying to protect against flooding happening. Then how much of that is then met by hard engineering and how much is met by soft engineering? So hard engineering, you've got permanent walls and embankments. That's what they're mostly relying on in the current scheme. But as Roger said, you could also look at individual properties. You can also look at cluster properties, so Mountjoy Terrace. Is, Roger's photograph showed that really nicely. That, that, that group of houses is they separate, actually, from anywhere else. You could come up with a, a, an answer for that cluster of buildings. And you can also have demountable defences. You don't have to have permanent. Um, so they have to, obviously, you need workforce to get there and install them in time. Um, but that would be a way that we could look at what is the risk in the next 10 or 20 years. We could say, let's try demountable, and then if that works, great. If it doesn't, if, we, if the flooding, if flooding was to happen, the demountables don't work, then we can say, okay, we are going to need permanent. But that gives us that breathing space. Um, soft engineering, we've got the reservoirs that they're already in the scheme now, the two small ones, but we could have a much bigger one called Gladhouse Reservoir, which is like probably 10 times bigger than the two small ones. They've not included that one. We've got natural flood management on the river and the coast. So, so then what you'd have is options assessment. So like, I don't want to go to the next. I'll go straight to the one with the table, actually. Uh, that one there. Yeah, so what I would suggest, what we should be having is a set of options developed. And that is, so you, you've got your, your high flow in the big rain event. How much of that, so you've got to get it down to the level that's going to be provide the right level of protection for the town. So let's say that's a metre of additional water in height in the river. How much of that is then addressed by using natural flood management, by reservoirs, permanent defences, demountable defences, or individual property level? And these are some different scenarios. So you could have this option one is, would be very little natural flood management, but relying more on hard defences. Whereas this one here, you have a much bigger proportion of natural flood management and relatively small amount of hard defences, but you've got a big amount of demountable ones in that scenario. This is what we haven't had. So we've just been given one scenario, which is actually not like any of these, because it's basically 5%. It's that one there plus 90%. That's the current So We have nothing there, nothing there, and nothing there. That's all, that's all they're looking at. So... As Audrey was saying, I mean, any scheme of this magnitude and importance should always have options that the council should be given options and they should be given ability to evaluate each of those and come to a decision based upon, you know, proper evaluation using the right tools. Next slide. Um, so just, just a little bit on demountable defences, and if I could go to the next slide. Um, this is an example from a town called Bewdley on the River Severn in Worcestershire. Um, so the river is prone to flooding. It's a very large river. The Severn is a huge catchment. And they've, so their preferred adoption for the last 20 years has been demountables. And you can see them installed here. So workmen come along when the risk is high and they'll slot in the metal defences. Now that has worked for you know, several decades. However, there's been repeated problem of flooding in this area here of Bewdley. So they've actually now decided to move to permanent defences because, you know, they need something, you know, because the risk is not properly managed by the demountables. So, you know, I'm not saying this will completely solve the problem. It all depends on the level of water coming down, etc. But it would certainly buy us time. So it would buy us, I, I, I would guess, 10 years' time. Um, so... So the next question is, you know, what do we do in that 10 years? And on the next slide. And what I'd like to suggest there is that, actually maybe go, yeah, so what, what we could do in that 10 years is really work on the natural flood management options. So estimates vary how much can they reduce the high flow rate. So a low level would be something like 5%. Um, that's what the Edelston Water Project shows at the moment. A high level in the literature there's values up to 70 percent that's too ambitious i think for the esc i would say we're probably talking about a realistic level of 40 percent might be something 30 to 40 percent 
to begin with, and it might be able to increase over time, but it's going to take a long time to demonstrate uh, because it's a, it's a new idea. It's, if you compare it to um, en hard engineering, we, you know, there's a lot more, you know, thousands of you, you, you know, that's been done since the Romans. So we've got massive experience and knowledge of hard engineering. Natural flood's much, much earlier stage, which is why we need to put money in, invest in it to work out what will work. Inevitably, it will start in a number of small schemes, and as we work out which ones work best, then we scale up and we find new locations. There's a lot of discussions have to happen with landowners, because you know, most of the land is privately owned, so you can't just go and build a natural flood scheme. You've got to get the landowner involved, and they'll be cautious, they're often quite cautious. So it's an incremental process of investing in natural flood management, working out what works, then scaling it up. We need the government support to provide the incentives. And then that's why I'm saying you can't just do this in a couple of years. It's going to take five to ten years. But the demountable defences would, and the individual property level, would actually buy us the time. So we could actually be doing both. And then ten years' time or so, we look at it all again, and then we say, OK, now we've understood what percentage of the high flow can be tackled by the natural flood management, then what, what would that then mean in terms of more permanent defences going forwards? And this is a key problem with the current scheme, is that they're not taking an incremental approach. It's a one-off project for 2100, which is, you know, ridiculous. So a much more sensible way is to say, let's take 20, 30-year periods and plan and review as we go along and then we adjust the design accordingly and engineers have to get better at designing things that can be adjusted so i'm not persuaded at all when they say oh we can't do that it will be too expensive i'd say the engineering community you need to go and work out how to become more flexible in how you do design and make it cost effective that you can do these things you can add on so if we need to add on a, two feet onto the flood protection in 40 years time you know, design it so that that can be done cost effectively now. And, and so I think it's a failure of innovation and imagination on the part of engineers that they say they can't do this. And in reality, we know it's, it's being driven more by the government funding cycle. So they're desperate to try and get it built sooner before it then would have to go into a different part of the funding cycle, which will make it harder for them to get away with what they're currently proposing. Um, so this, yeah, so the, the, this was just to explain the approach of the neighbourhood panels, um, and so I think I've explained all that, so I can move on. Um, so um, I'll, I'll, if anyone wants a slide by with, with words, happy to, to pass that on. Um, do you want to go on? Um, so how long will this all take? So what I'm suggesting is a radical departure. So this, you know, government was like, oh my God, you know, what, a, what on earth is this you're suggesting? This isn't how we do things. Um, and what I'm guessing, okay, it's not how we do things, but actually we need to change. We do need to change quite radically because we know the current, you know, if they try and do this, what they've done in Muscle, everywhere in Scotland, it'll, you can imagine the problems they're going to run into, which is why they've got this flood resilience strategy to try and think of a new approach. So we would actually be contributing to changing how things are done. As Roger said, we'd be actually pioneering a whole new way of thinking about how to do flood management and how to involve, crucially, how do you take communities with you instead of imposing solutions on them? Um, so we need, you know, we've, got, we've had a breakdown of trust between the public and the council and the protection scheme. So we need to rebuild that trust and that will take time. That will take a few years. So I think this is why I'm saying, you know, it will take five to 10 years to work out what is, how do, what is the role of the natural flood management measures at the river and the coast? Um, and, um, but, you know, and we would then have to accept there is a small risk, because every year you know, it's a 0.5% risk of that really, really big event like 1948. So if we delay the scheme, there is a slight risk that we could get one of those really big events in the, in the years where we're waiting. We'd have to accept, OK, we're willing to take that risk. And if it did happen, we'd have to kind of suck that up and say, OK, we did decide that. We decided it was risk worth taking. But of course, you know, even the current scheme... Take years to build. It will take... Obviously, it will take years to build, yeah. But if we delay it by, 
you know, if we were to sort of delay things, then it will, you know, there's that slight increased risk anyway. But I mean, even the current scheme, as as the consultants themselves have been very honest about, it does not protect against all events at all. And as we saw in Brecon, that is built to one in 200 year return period and it failed to protect the town. So there's no guarantee with any of this because we don't, in the end, we don't know what kind of, what the biggest events are going to be. Because you always have a one in a thousand year return period event that's even bigger that could also happen, you know, 0.1% probability. So there's no, you know, you can't, there isn't 100% protection, it cannot be the case. So that's why in the end it all comes down to our risk thermostats, what sort of level of risk do we want to live with. Um, but I'm just, I just really want to point out there is, a, you know, there is a risk in doing this, that a small risk I think, but it's nevertheless there. Um, um, so, so, you know, if people, if, if, if people didn't want to wait this extra time, and if, for example, there's a, a silent part of Musselburgh, who is sort of basically feel they are at risk and they want a solution as soon as possible. I've spoken to people like that. They say, oh no, just come up with a solution. I feel, you know, we just need to build something. Um, that might just be because they've got a lower acceptance of risk. You know, they're just more scared about this stuff than, than some other people. So um, what if the government, Scottish government, doesn't come up with a new flood resilience strategy or they don't implement it quickly, they don't create incentives to do natural flood management. Um, there's a reluctance to involve the public. So what, what, is, what could we still do? If we got a pause, what could we do if there was a less ambition, if you like, on the part of government and East Lothian Council? So do you want to go to the next slide? Um, so what I call a real politic position, if, if, if that were to be the case, it's a kind of reduced version of what I said. So you could still... You could still commit, though, to using dialogue methods rather than top-down consultation. And by the way, those involving citizen panels, all that, I mean, that's a widely understood method now that's used across lots of policy issues, including climate change. In the Scotland, they had the Scottish Climate Assembly. They had one in, in the UK level. They had one about abortion in Ireland. They've used them a lot in the United States. So these ideas are actually involving public directly rather than relying on our elected politicians, has got increasing validity. And the methods are all there, that, you know, the well-established ways of doing this. It's not like a new thing. It's like there's, there's people who do this stuff for, for a living. Um, and, and so there's a you know, lot of experience in how you use dialogue methods for engagement. Um, and that would be able to, to help us get, work out this agreed level of standard protection still and we could also commit to doing natural flood management in the S catchment. So the Hoyk scheme cost £88 million. Not one penny was spent on natural flood management, uh, which I find unbelievable. I mean, how can, given the government has committed to, to doing natural flood management since about 2011, how can it be that there's not one, not one penny spent when they spent 88 million on hard engineering. I mean, it's just bonkers. Because clearly, if you don't invest in it, you're not going to work out what works, what the potential is. So the whole system at the moment is just reeked, really, against funding natural flood management. And it requires leadership from the council. I think if the council had wished to push natural flood management, it would have been an open door into government. I believe they would have been able to get commitment to fund from the project scheme because it is written into the act that you can look at natural flood management or they call it river-based management but it's the same thing so so i think in terms of the amount of money that could be spent i think there should be a, a commitment to spend several million pounds in the next three years in the s catchment which would be about 10 percent of the total budget um, I don't think, we, in a way, we don't want to spend too much now because we still don't quite know what to spend it on. So it should be, you know, like in the initial amount of a few million. And then if it, when we work out what works really well and how to make it effective, then we would increase the budget and scale up accordingly. So, thank you. Do you know how much our poor drainage affects our flood risk? 
So you've got the sewers and the, the, the sort of, you know, two lots of drainage, the sewer drains, as it were, and the public call the kind of road drains. Um, so one is the responsibility, the road drains are responsibility of the council and the sewers are responsibility of Scottish Water. But of course they're interconnected as well because there's various ways that the two systems um, leak into each other. Hence you get this thing called combined sewer overflows. Um, so it's a really, it's, it, the, I think Scottish Water is supposed to be producing a report on, on how they're managing the risk of flooding from their part of the infrastructure. Uh, but clearly it is, a, it is a big problem in lo localised problem parts of Musselburgh. Um, and I believe, who was it, saying that Andy Forrest, somebody, somebody earlier was saying to contact Andy Forrest about any problems that they're, they're experiencing in the local drain network. So apparently that's the council to direct all that to. But I mean, it, you know, it's a good point that, you know, we're, we're, we're facing already flooding problems. The, this scheme doesn't appear to be addressing at all. So again, it's like, it seems a bit odd really when the commitment they made was to protect against all sources of flooding. We can take more questions. Well, just, um, just one point, I mean, Scottish Water are obviously already doing something because they've got a year-long programme going on at the pumping station yeah, and yeah. it's quite clear, it's stated, they now put up billboards to tell yeah. you that actually it's <coughs> part of their response to increased risk of flooding. So they're, they're obviously actually already trying to do a bit of their bit. Yeah, yeah. But my question is really about, I mean, the time scale we have um, in order to achieve a change is now very limited yeah. because this report is due to go to the council in January. So my question is, what is the actual process by which objections can actually, if need be, I mean, clearly it would be good if we could actually get an agreement, but I mean, <coughs> there must be a provision, I mean, just like within the planning system, um, I know that's not exactly the same for this, but as soon as you lodge a, a, an objection, there has to actually be a stop and a look at it. Now, I mean, I know when, for example, the um, issue of the school, then the Portobello High School proposal yeah. to build on the, the links. Now, I mean, obviously I would have supported that, but there were people who were opposed to it. Yeah. And actually, they actually held up that provision by 10 years. A whole generation of children actually missed out on a new school. I mean, we don't want to do that. But is there a provision whereby a, an objection at a critical point can actually stop this in its tracks if we had, if that was the only way to get some pause in it? Because that's something we need to know. What is the date and what are the provisions for lodging an objection and who can do it? We've got some slides at the end about that. All right, OK. And then um, we will address that. Right, OK. Well, I'll need some help. <laughs> Yeah, but the point really is that uh, there, I don't think there's any formal way of objecting before they've made their decision. No, no, but once, they're, once they make their decision, yeah. is there... There is a formal process. Right, OK. Yeah. And we'll come to that. That's, well, yeah. that's fine, because yeah. that but may need to be used, <coughs> given the obduracy it would appear at the moment, and given the limited amount of time. So, I mean, we need to be clear about that so that we don't miss that date, if that's what it takes. I think that's where a lot of our energy is now right. going to need okay. to go. Yeah. Um, but there's nothing stopping us as individuals and collectively saying, you know, before Christmas, mm -hmm. you, you know, we're not going to support you. Yeah. We're going to object. Yeah. So you better come clean and let us see what it is. Right. You okay. know, that was the gist of what Fine. I was saying. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sorry, not sorry. What happens at the end of the flood wall? Hey, you mean it, it you mean when it gets to Port Jopper? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean that's it. Yeah, I mean that's a classic example, isn't it, of local authorities in silos, as we've seen with the complete failure to engage with Mid Lothian, East Lothian. I mean, again, they're completely failing to engage with City of Edinburgh. I mean, it's a nonsense, isn't it, not to look at that as a coastal zone and have a coordinated approach to protection. So, I mean, this is a problem, the way the Act, the 2009 Act has given all the power to the local authority, and it hasn't got enough safeguards to ensure that the local authorities are 
acting across the catchment. And that's a very different approach from England, where the environment agencies in control of projects, and they'll bring five local authorities together in a project, and the environment agency is leading the project. They employ the consultants, but the environment agency, the experts. What we've ended up here is we've, we've handed over the, the project to the private sector, to the companies, to determine what should be done. The councillors and the local officials just do not have the knowledge or skills or ability to interrogate what they're being told. And I, I've listened to the councillors' meeting and their questioning of the Musselburgh Flood Protection Scheme, and they do not know what to ask, and they don't have the capability to ask. I don't blame them, because why should they? It's incredibly technical. But it's the wrong, there's, you know, the whole system's not designed correctly. And I think most professionals in flood management realise that judging from my discussions with the flood, the new flood resilience strategy, a lot of professionals involved in that, they seem to also recognise the limitations of the approach in Scotland. I mean, it's sad, really, but... But the worry is on, on that is the Cabinet Secretary has made it very clear to her officials that this is going to remain a local council responsibility on the one hand, and yet then... Yeah, we've got to challenge that, actually. Challenge. And that's... That's why this is not just a Musselburgh issue, mm -hmm. this is a, a nationwide issue. Mm -hmm. and the, the, the discussions we've had with people in other communities is really <coughs> important to have a more concerted effort to say, government, you've got to rethink some yeah. things. And we will have an opportunity sometime in the spring of next year when the Scottish Government's Flood Resilience Strategy Review Report is published but some of us are going to get in there before that and say these are the things that we think you've got to change. You've got to take more responsibility because it's more of your money than it is local government money. Mm -hmm.